Asi amnesiaya, ain't the pet tani slanemoch, ain't the pet klishen tani hupachaset, ait no squalo in quanas ich e heitzepka heitzepka si amnestimoch. Hello everyone, my name is Doug White. My Co Salish name is Qualoselton from the Snanemo people. On my mother's side of my family, my name is Kleshan from the Hupachusset people of the Nuchanoth Nation. I'm very happy to have a moment here to share with you a few thoughts and ideas about Indigenous law on behalf of the Indigenous Law Research Unit. So thank you very much for joining us. My name is Doug White. My Co Salish name is Qualoselton. My Nuchanoth name is Kleshan. I'm a lawyer, I'm the director of the Centre for Pre-Confederation Treaties and Reconciliation at Vancouver Island University. Uh, I went to law school at the University of Victoria and uh, practiced law in Vancouver. And uh, so I've been working with Indigenous communities all across the province and across the country over the last uh, seven or eight years now. What does Indigenous law mean to you? I think it's important for everyone to know that all of these different legal orders and traditions have existed for thousands of years and there's multiple of them all across the Northwest Coast, all across British Columbia, all across the country. There's such a rich and beautiful diversity of traditions, of different cultures, languages, all uh, a part of which the, the Indigenous legal orders are an important component. And so they're, they've been there for thousands of years. They've obviously been in, in important ways displaced and, and roughed up by the history of colonialism, but nonetheless they continue to operate and exist across the, the land. They continue to operate and exist within the lives of individual Indigenous peoples, Indigenous families, Indigenous communities, and in between, from Indigenous community to Indigenous community, Indigenous law and everything that it represents and everything that it emanates from, everything that it, that it functions in relation to, uh, continues to be very real in the lives of our peoples. That includes everything from making decisions to name your children and how you do that. Do you have the rights to name this child with this name? Uh, using what ceremony, uh, how to get married, how to bury someone, how do you seat someone or recognize them as a leader. All of these different things are different aspects of our pre-existing Indigenous legal order that come from us, that are a part of who we are as a people. So at the core of our identity, we've got all of these questions on a regular basis about how do we organize our lives, how do we live our lives together as Indigenous peoples, uh, which families have what rights and what part of our territories in terms of resource use, in terms of going to, uh, you know, how do we protect sacred sites for bathing and other kinds of rituals. And then it also, uh, it gets to um, the dimension of when we think about where we're from, the territory that we belong to, that there's this inextricable aspect and linkage between the, the nation of people itself and their territory. Uh, so, the, so there's the individual, there's their membership in a broader community, and then there's their relationship with their territory that is all, all of it is, there, there's so much law around that. There's so much tradition, there, there's, so much, there's so much politics, history, uh, the social aspect of, of life and law is a, is a critical dimension of how people think about themselves and their relationship to each other and to their territories. And then of course that also exists between nations. Um, there's all different kinds of aspects of, of law that, that continues to be meaningful and continues to be used on a regular basis. And it's very, uh, very rich, very uh, diverse. Uh, it, it guides the lives of people, it guides the way nations are unfolding at this very moment. And I think that over the course of time, when we get decisions like the Supreme Court of Canada decision last summer, the Tsilkotin Nation decision, that really for the first time, uh, it's a funny decision because on the one hand, uh, it, it does not explicitly talk about Indigenous legal orders in a very powerful way, but implicitly in the, in the structure, the way they talk about what Aboriginal title is, it's inescapable that we understand Aboriginal title being governmental in its nature, that it's most, it's, what it's really about is about a state or uh, some kind of a sovereign entity's relationship with territory and structuring how a people uh, make decisions about it, how they gather up their, their priorities and state their priorities, how they how they express um, the, the rules and principles and values, the laws about how territories can be used. That's, um, so on the, on the, in the implicit structure of the Aboriginal title decision, there's a really powerful recognition of self-determination, self-government, authority, jurisdiction, where all, all of those different categories that, where law is a very important player. Um, 
the, the thing that's interesting about the decision and a little bit shocking about the decision is that the court, when they said, what are the implications of recognizing Aboriginal title? When we say that this part of the world is now Aboriginal title, what does it mean for provincial jurisdiction specifically? Can provincial jurisdiction still operate or does it need to make way for the jurisdiction of Aboriginal peoples, of Indigenous peoples? And to our great surprise and shock, uh, what they said was that, well, if Aboriginal, when Aboriginal title is recognized, of course provincial jurisdiction must apply or else there would be a legal vacuum. And that word legal vacuum, the thought that there's no law, save for provincial law and jurisdiction and authority, there would be nothing, right? This notion of uh, terra nullius, which is, a, which is an old legal concept that, uh, that societies and peoples are of such a low order of organization and civilization, this notion that somehow some people are lower and some people are higher, and that the people at the lower end of the scale are not sophisticated enough to have things like law or society or meaningful society, and therefore they cannot have law or property rights or territorial rights, um, is somehow still, it's still lingering in the body of law in Canada. So there's been an incredible amount of, uh, of work done over the past 50 years in developing Canadian law, but there's still a long way to go. And I think that when I think about the role of Indigenous law from this point forward, I think that the real development, the real meaningful work, in some ways the, the Canadian legal system is done and finished. It's work, it's sort of set some parameters and set the table in some way. The real work now is on the, is, it needs to come from the Indigenous peoples themselves. Them articulating, when, when we think about the, the principle of consent, for example, in the Aboriginal title decision, uh, it's a fundamental transformation from what's been existing for the last 150 years in Canada. Even with the Haida Nation decision that was very transformative a decade ago, it was still very much about the idea that there is one decision maker in this country and that's the Crown in relation to Crown lands. And as part of that decision making framework, they must go and engage with First Nations, consult, potentially accommodate. Uh, but that, you know, once they've done that work, then they go back and they make their crown decision about the crown lands. What the, what the Tsukotan Nation decision says, is it says there's two decision makers. Sometimes there's going to be only one decision maker, sometimes there's going to be two decision makers. But there's, a, there's an indigenous decision maker in the room. That the indigenous peoples have decision making power and authority about their lands, and because of that, that gives rise to the need for the crown to seek the consent of the indigenous peoples for any decisions made or in relation to that space. And so this is a major transformation. And we need to have, um, uh, in, in terms of making the most of the decision and implementing it in the most powerful way, we need that consent principle that's premised and arises from the, uh, the self-determination and self-government decision-making authority and jurisdiction of Indigenous peoples to be as expansive and, and as powerful as it can be. We need to occupy the field with our own indigenous laws, right? We need indigenous law of each individual nation to be expressed and articulated and to be, you know, we know that it's all, always been there, but we need in some way for that to become less obscure because it's very obscure to the Canadian legal order. Judges will sit back and they'll say, uh, for example, uh, Justice McEachran in the, in the Delgamuk litigation, he said, I don't know what you guys think you're doing bringing this old lady into my courtroom and having her sing to me like i don't i this he talked about being embarrassed at this but he allowed it and what the gitsan watsuotan people were doing was they were articulating and singing their laws and their traditions they were trying to share with canada who they are how they think what, what their epistemologies are their worldview how it all comes together to inform them and their relationship with their lands. An important part of that is encapsulated in the adokh and the songs and the traditions of those people. Um, but it was a, something that's very difficult for the courts to grapple with. Uh, it was very nice to see the, the former uh, Chief Justice of British Columbia, Lance Finch, recently talk about the duty of the legal process, the legal system in Canada, that they have a duty to learn he put, put this paper forward at a conference a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago now. And he said, you know, there's a real problem here 
when, when all of these amazing legal traditions are so obscure to us. It's not your responsibility to teach us that. It's our responsibility as Canadian lawyers and judges to learn, to reach out and to seek understandings about these legal traditions because it's a meaningful part of the Canadian legal framework. And the Canadian legal fra framework has to be able to, uh, to, to work with those legal traditions in a coherent and meaningful way. And for that to happen, we need to raise the level of understanding in the Canadian legal process about those traditions. But in terms of the, the role and the function of Indigenous law, I think it really it's going to be critically important to help to, to occupy the field of consent and to narrow down. To, to, there, there's a couple of pathways that the court opened up. One is about partnership and consent and recognition and reconciliation. And unfortunately, the other one that they laid out is, you know what, if, if the Crown is not able to achieve that, they can, they can just fall back to consultation and accommodation and to seek to justify infringements. All of this sort of lawyer's nonsense, this, this stuff that, that is about it's, about, it's premised on the idea that we don't matter to each other, that we don't need to work things out, that there's actually a path where, that, where we don't matter to each other. And we can just go down pathways of conflict and we can end up in courts and the Crown can go and seek to justify the infringement of Aboriginal title, Aboriginal rights. And we need to really make clear that that's just not a plausible pathway. And part of building the most plausible, uh, respectful pathway of recognition and reconciliation is really making clear the Indigenous peoples doing some of the work of making clear to the Crown what the world looked like, what the world and how the law will function in accordance with their own traditions and finding ways to articulate that. Because when people don't know, I mean, that's the ignorance is the foundation of a lot of fear. And so if we can do the work of overcoming the ignorance, and I'm not saying that in a negative way, I'm just saying that as a matter of fact, that's just a reality, people don't know. If we can help to overcome the level of ignorance that exists in the Canadian legal system, the Canadian political system and Canadian society about who we are and who, what our laws are about, then it will help to deal with the fear that gets in the way of real meaningful partnership and progress. So those are some of the off the top of my head when I think about Indigenous law and its role in all the relationship, the role in our communities and our lives and our relations with the Crown and Canadian society. I think it's very critical. It's very important work right now. The work that my grandmother's done, Ellen White, uh, Dr. Ellen White, her name's Colossal Witt, uh, she's done work all of her life and she got a lot of uh, pushback from the community for her work of sharing Coast Salish traditions with the outside world. But very early on she understood that it's an important part of the work is to help people know us and to understand who we are. And she, some of this, she did uh, children's books. She took long, complicated, sophisticated adult stories and made them um, uh, for children, right? The, to put them in a simplified form to try She did that primarily to comfort the elders of the Coast Salish world that were concerned about her sharing the Snowiath or the sacred teachings and knowledge of our people with, uh, with everybody else. And, um, and you know, it's, it's interesting because the, the Tsleil-Waututh, they just did a, their own environmental assessment of the Kinder Morgan project over in Vancouver. And they said, they said to the world, we're going to do our own environmental assessment in accordance with our own law about how we make decisions about things like this. And they turned to a body of knowledge from the Coast Salish world, including my grandmother's stories, were part of the foundation that they used to articulate their own, the Coast Salish legal principles that they then applied in the environmental assessment of Kinder, the Kinder Morgan proposal for the, uh, the terminal over in Burnaby. And um, I thought that was quite an interesting example of, of the way that, you know, building upon half a century of, of work and of people trying to share and to illuminate our, the way that we think, the, the, you know, what our laws are in a very explicit and powerful way. I think about in, uh, you know, in terms of the legal, the interacting with the Canadian legal process in a certain way began half a century ago here in the Nanaimo, in the White and Bob litigation. And when, when we won that litigation that said that the treaty between the Nanaimo and the Crown is valid, it actually exists, and the court said that we will enforce it, it's legally enforceable and we will enforce this treaty. And what it means in this context, in this circumstance, 
is that the Provincial Game Act or the Provincial Law and Jurisdiction, it has no constitutional force. It can't apply to interfere with the operation of the hunting treaty rights of the Slanemo. And so it really pushed back. And in, the, in Canadian society, so you, you read some of the press clippings, and I talked to my late grandfather about some of this stuff. People said, oh my gosh, well, it's going to be a free-for-all now. So what, what the Canadian public said after the White and Bob decision of recognition of rights, that there will be no constraints, that the, that the Aboriginal people are now going to run amok in the woods and go and kill all the deer, is no different from what the Supreme Court, the unanimous Supreme Court of Canada just said this past summer. That, oh my God, you know, if we recognize this right, but we don't, but we don't recognize that the provincial law can apply, then it's going to be lawlessness. There will be nothing to constrain anyone. It's a real challenge. I mean, this is a deeply seated, rooted idea in the Canadian imagination that we've got to find a way to overcome, to displace. And so we think about how these different laws are articulated and, and held in, from one community to the next. Uh, there's all, you know, we live in a very rich and diverse part of uh, the country where, um, like in the Coast Salish world, uh, the, the cultural literacy and vibrancy, both linguistically and, and ceremonially and spiritually, is very much alive and powerful. There's, you know, traditions are being passed on. Elders are sitting down with younger people and teaching, the, sharing the Snawayath, the teachings of our people, about how, how are you meant to live your life? How, are, you know, how do you behave in, in certain circumstances? How do you overcome this kind of a situation or that kind of a situation? How do families interact? All of this stuff. How do we relate to our neighbors down, you know, further, further away from us? All of those things are constantly being discussed and shared and passed down. And, I know that's true of many of the different nations up and down British Columbia. And so it becomes when we see um, the strategic importance of that law and those traditions uh, being put forward to serve our people and to make clear to Canadians, the Canadian system, the legal system, the political system, industry, the public, about why they're a critical part of what is what Canada has become now, I think that we'll be able to like communities and nations will start to understand and see how it can be a very powerful um, activity to to very explicitly. I'm not saying to codify. I think there's problems with you can't just go down a codification pathway because that fundamentally distorts and changes the way the legal system works. But you need to find ways to illuminate the system to make it clear how it functions, what its principles are. Um, and, and I think that, uh, you know, the project that I've been involved with, with the Indigenous uh, Law Research Unit, uh, when I was chief at Slanemo, we did work, uh, Professor Val Napoleon and others uh, said very explicitly, we want to start doing some of this work and illuminating the, the different legal systems in different ways. So for us, the Coast Salish, we took a look at a couple of different sort of bodies of law, very specific categories, and we used stories and we used interviews with elders to really start to lay down and, and to try and uh, come up with, with, a, with a body of different legal principle and that, that can be shared and understood in a different format. Because the way that it's held within communities is not accessible to the public or to the Canadian political or legal system at all. So we need to find ways to overcome that. And, so the work that the, the ILRU's been doing across the country, I think, is a very important step in that regard. Because uh, Canada cannot function. It can't function politically or economically or socially without having this knowledge. It's critical knowledge to what Canada is. Can you say more about the 2014 Silco Teen decision? Last summer, the Supreme Court of Canada made a very historic and important decision that's of sweeping scope and transformative significance for Canadian society at large. When it put forward the very first legal declaration of Aboriginal title, something that no court had ever done in the history of Canada, there has been 40 years of litigation where judges had made a very specific decision not to make decisions, to find sort of cute ways to find technical reasons to avoid making a legal decision. 
They were doing that because they were trying to push things off to the political side and to say, look, we're happy to make legal principle, but we're, we feel quite uncomfortable with the thought of actually making decisions about this stuff. It's far too significant. It's far too complicated for the legal process to really grapple with. And so please, you know, we see this beautiful statement, even as late as the late uh, Justice Vickers trial level decision, in his uh, decision, he spent about 20 paragraphs toward the end of his decision talking about reconciliation and saying, please go and sit down and talk and sort this stuff out between peoples, between governments. You know, I think he, the words that he used were, we feel ill-equipped as a court and as a legal process to really deal with these issues. And there had been a treaty process in place and all of these different reasons that gave, gave judges comfort with the thought that they can go off and uh, they can make the legal, the legal theory and then someone else can actually make the real decisions and do it through agreement. And, um, but there was a, obviously we, we came to a critical point over the last couple of years as the Aboriginal title decision made its way up to the court we came to a very critical point politically and legally. And I think it's illuminated by the example of the, or, or by the story of the Halkomenum Treaty Group that went down to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. And they went to ask that commission to say something about the fact that as a people, as an indigenous people in Canada, they have no way to have their Aboriginal title established. Their legal right to their Aboriginal title. They have no pathway to get that work done. That's critical to protecting their human rights and for, for them to have proper, uh, respectful lives unfold. And the Canada pushed back very hard on them going to that international arena and said, uh, as a matter of international law and proceeding, the Halkomenian people can, are not properly before this commission because they have not exhausted their domestic remedies. This is getting a little technical, but the basic storyline is that Indigenous peoples in Canada, the Canadian government said, could either go to court and have their Aboriginal title declared, or they could go through negotiations and have their Aboriginal title established that way. The Halkomenum Treaty Group and numerous individual First Nations and First Nations organizations across the country sent down, as part of the response to Canada's attack on the petition and their standing, they sent down uh, briefs to the court, to, to the commission, to tell the story about the legal process in Canada and the political negotiations process in Canada. And they told the, this long story, this 40-year storyline from the Calder decision through Dalgamook uh, all the way through into Tsilkotin and the other Aboriginal title decisions that have been uh, taking place over the years, 40 years. All of the decades of effort, tens of millions of dollars of money spent in litigation and there was not a single grain of sand in the second largest country on the face of the earth that had ever been declared by a Canadian judge to be Aboriginal title. That was a pretty damning storyline and bit of evidence put in front of the commission. <clears throat> and then they talked about the BC treaty process that had been set up a generation earlier and said, this was the intent. We, went to, we helped to create this process because we expected to be able to go and talk about establishing our title. To our great shock, the Crown came to that process with an impoverished mandate that asked our peoples to effectively set aside and extinguish our Aboriginal title and to take in place of it a fee simple, something utterly different. And so the, having heard all of these, different, these two different storylines, the Inter-American Commission agreed, and to the great embarrassment of Canada, they said, we grant the Halkomenum Treaty Group standing in this process for the two reasons that uh, the Canadian legal process does not, has not provided any remedy to Indigenous peoples in Canada in relation to their Aboriginal title. And uh, for the, the treaty process for its part, quite apart from establishing title, in fact, effectively requires First Nations, Indigenous peoples to extinguish their title. So there is no effective domestic remedy inside of Canada for Indigenous peoples, and therefore they have standing to argue in front of this commission. So that, those two, I, I think that that really encapsulates what was in front of the politicians and what was in front of the judges when that Aboriginal title decision was making its way up to the Supreme Court of Canada.
there was a major decision to be made by the court. And, and it gets to the very core and the essence of the legal process. Is the legal process going to continue to play any meaningful role in the ongoing reconciliation about Aboriginal title in this country or not? Because Indigenous people should know. I mean, we as Indigenous people should know if the courts are ever going to make a decision. Because if what they're saying is there's actually something like an American political questions doctrine at play, that this is just too political, it's not properly a justiciable issue, like it's not, you can't bring this kind of an issue to court, then we should know that so we can stop wasting our time and our money. And we will uh, fight in other ways. Um, and so for, you know, to the, I really acknowledge the courage shown by the, by the justices because I think they really recognized the moment that we were in. And they rose to that moment. And I think they crafted a powerful decision where they recognized an expansive territoriality of Aboriginal title. And more importantly, they really declared that title. In the history of Canada, the only time Aboriginal title has ever been recognized has been to extinguish it, at least in the Canadian side of the story, through treaty. That doesn't line up with the, 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 the Aboriginal treaty partner for the most part. Uh, they were not about extinguishment, but that on the Canadian side, that's what they believed they were doing. And so now we've got an entirely different space that opens up where where Aboriginal title lives and breathes and where its effect is transformative, it upends and it pushes back on a hundred and, in British Columbia at least, 150 years of law and policy, provincially speaking, is premised on the wrong ideas, the wrong understandings. That, you know, the, the, the whole storyline of, of the province of British Columbia is that Aboriginal title doesn't matter. And then more recently, Maybe it matters, and if it does, it only really matters in small spots. Well, all of that has been blown back and pushed aside. And so we're, we enter into a, a, a state and a, and a situation of deep uncertainty about decision-making over what has been called crown lands for a long time. But the courts now tell us a major portion of that is now properly Aboriginal title lands. So if we don't start to grapple with uh, the need to understand the proper relationship. If, 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 uh, if the Crown thinks that it can still sit back and, and stick mostly to the status quo, then it's just going to lead to really deep conflict and uncertainty across the province and across the country. Industry will grind to a halt. Uh, conflict will be the prevailing uh, mode of relations. Um, and so this is a moment where we need really strong leadership, where we really need Canadians to understand uh, some of the basics of this scenario about why it's important to understand uh, the proper relationships that Aboriginal peoples have with their territories, what their legal systems are in relation to it in, in terms of decision making, how consent is, uh, consent is a principle that should be guiding the relationship between the, the Crown and Indigenous peoples, and that that's a pathway of certainty, of predictability, of respect, of reconciliation, and it's our work at this moment is to, uh, is to really make the most of that, to do our best, to show the greatest respect and honour we can to the work that's been done that has brought us to this point. I think that the decision fundamentally brings us back to the first principles of our relationship. The decision, it, it's so powerful in its effect that it requires the Crown and Indigenous peoples to return to the first moment of their relationship and to ask themselves the most basic questions again and to work together to provide answers. But who are we? Who are the indigenous peoples? What, what's, what makes up us, you know, in terms of our legal orders, our, uh, our political history, our cultural history, our linguistic reality? Who are we, right? Who is Canada? What are, what's our proper relationship to each other and to territories, and how are we gonna work together? We truly have to, I mean, this is the moment that we're in that we as Canadians need to grapple with and understand that we're in a very critical moment, a defining moment. And uh, there's going to be a lot of hard work done, but it's, it's great and beautiful work of trying to build patterns of reconciliation and respect, of, of trying to repair what is the single most important public policy issue in Canada, which is the Aboriginal reality and the way that the Crown in Canada needs to, to, to um, interact with Aboriginal peoples in a fundamentally different way. This is the, in my mind, this is the big issue of our country. And we've never, we, as a country, we've never had too many defining moments, if ever.
Well, I think we're in a defining moment. And uh, so the, the, the work of understanding indigenous laws and how they play into that, the, the critical work that indigenous law has in helping to answer those questions, uh, it's never been more important.